On this week's podcast, it's Jack and I are going to have a chat about one of the things which can plague people's trading program, and that is the plateau. So the title is something on the lines of which Jack will decide later <laughs> exactly how it appears, but how to continue making progress. And plateaus can be one of the most frustrating and demoralizing um, episodes in a trading program, in a trading block, but also over a longer period of time. So we're going to pull some of this apart, real short little hit today, just give you some ideas and hopefully some inspiration to try and kind of break through those plateaus um, or kind of tackle ones when they come at you in the future. Yeah. So you're equipped and prepared. So if you've been around and done any amounts of trading for any period of time, you know, as long as you do something consistently, you make some progress initially. It's like, what happens? What happens after that? And so we've uh, we've been through those frustrations as well. So we felt it with you. But um, one of the, some of the things that um, will actually obviously help is having some guidance. And so working with some coaches, etc. And we're very excited that the 2022 workshops are kicking off. We've already run a six week um bodyweight basics that's been online but we've got our face-to-face -face workshops coming back this coming weekend as you listen to this as long as the date of this is going out correctly it should be the 16th of february on saturday the 19th we are in staffordshire um there is probably a couple of places still left hopefully um and then we are in london on the 6th of march we've got a brand new workshop experience it's a full day um, it's discounted to 125 quid if you're a member there's some discount codes for you to get it for just 99 quid or if you're vip for 75 quid um, so do check those out the links will be in the show notes on the or go to the website scorecardsnetics.com and just click on the, the workshops and retreats tab great point jacko about getting some help to get through plateaus sometimes what you need is just a couple of different exercise progressions yeah. the right coaching cues and that can be enough if you're working on a specific skill but let's not go too far down that line of inquiry let's get into podcast so sit back and enjoy a little bit of information about how to break through plateaus roll that jingle listen players <laughs> You're listening to the Movement, Strength and Play podcast by the School of Calisthenics. Here are your hosts, Tim and Jacko. So, Timbo, plateaus. Um, have you ever had one? Many. <laughs> I was going to say, if you said no then, it was going to be like, hold on, how come? This either, so, the reality, just I wanted to put some context to people of, um, you're listening along to this, like, you're thinking, yeah, correctly, I've had a plateau. If you're the one person out there that has never had a plateau, it's like, I don't know, either you're a genius you're or maybe you haven't been training right. <laughs> yeah, you're a better strength and conditioning coach than me. <laughs> um, but essentially, we've all had plateaus and actually continuing to make progress can be frustrating, can be challenging. And, you know, in terms of that frustration, the challenge, like how that affects our motivation um, it then can actually create a vicious cycle, like a downward spiral of like, we get frustrated, we don't, we've stopped making progress. So actually we like, we stop doing stuff. And then, you know, if you stop doing it, you're definitely not going to progress. So understanding the psychology of it, I think is an, is an interesting and important point and knowing and feeling like you've got some advice and you've got some tools in your toolbox, um, to try and utilize, to notice when is a plateau upon me and uh, how can I get through it? So, um, what have been your... What have been some of your top tips, Timbo? Yeah, I think you make a good point about that consistency to start off with. Mm. Going, if this, this kind of having conversations with people who are like, if, if you are inconsistent with your training, then you are going to find these periods of plateau because we're just not getting that consistent um, exposure to the stimulus, which is going to result in adaptation. So if you're struggling to be consistent and you're kind of worrying about plateaus, just take a step back and just work out how you can be more consistent yeah. with your training. You'll often you'll break through yeah. there. So that's kind of point one. We'll go a bit micro and then I want to go like macro to finish just as a slightly bigger conversation. But I think the the, the one thing to, we're just going to throw out a couple of suggestions that I see massively and is underutilized. And I'm going to put it first and it's probably the one that people don't want to hear <laughs> rather than going, oh, it's this drill, this progression, this sort of reps and sets and whatever and tempo. The biggest reason I think people struggle with plateaus is rest and recovery. And they're just not doing enough of that or doing it well enough to enable the body to recover from the stress that you've placed upon it and then therefore adapt yeah. and go and break through. So <clears throat> we, we kind of talking a little bit around periodization here, which is a massive subject and people have written very long and sometimes boring <laughs> books about periodization, which are quite difficult to read and people get really geeky about it. 
But there's a guy in the States called Mike Boyle who's a very well-known strength and conditioning coach. And his kind of very simple approach to periodization is each week, can we put some more weight on the bar? Whatever that might be. And he also says, like, we often we kind of like sometimes get over, uh, we get over complicated periodization. And he's like, rest periods will come in a training cycle for most people. So there'll be weeks where work is crazy or if it's an athlete population, they've got a dentist appointment or they're traveling or something happens. But for most of us, there's a lot of times in our normal kind of weeks where training or every month, shall I say, mm. where you just get these breaks where actually I'll go from five sessions to two sessions. That's rest, right? So there's kind of there's that side of things to think about. Like it, my life is like that. I sometimes have these periods where I just don't get to train as much. So I can use those as deload weeks. For other people, if you are sort of training consistently, hitting four or five sessions a week and you don't have that disruption, then you need to start thinking about your rest and recovery. Because if you don't, I've used this analogy before, but I think it's always worth repeating. Every time you train, you dig a hole, right? And and the more you train, that the deeper that hole gets. Yeah. So when we're training athletes, so they're training five, six days a week over an extended period of time, we actually dig them quite a big hole. And our job then is when we do our recovery protocols, so we sleep, whatever that might be, our nutrition, hydration, all the kind of, we can get into that in a, probably in a different podcast, but the different sort of methods you've got to improve your recovery helps us to put a little bit of back in that hole and fill it back up a little bit. So we're constantly trying to balance this idea of creating enough stress that creates a favorable adaptation. The body then and the brain want to respond to adaptation to make you stronger, fitter, faster, whatever it might be. So it super compensates. And then we go and dig a little bit more of a hole through training and then we allow the recovery. Where a lot of people go wrong with this and one of the major reasons for plateauing is that they just keep digging all the time yeah. and there's no there's no space in their week or training program months whatever it might be where that hole actually gets filled back in a bit and the body then gets chance to super compensate we don't have rest weeks we don't deload if we are training consistently over months you are one going to hit plateaus and two risk of over overreaching to a point which is kind of that when you go to the towards that overtraining and in really chronic cases we get overtraining which is like a real system shut down big problem um people need to get more comfortable with resting and and this is this will be this will probably tee up jack to talk a bit about the psychology mm. but they get that training addiction i don't feel good unless yeah. i train you've got to learn that resting recovery is part of the process and you will feel better in the long term because you'll see those uh, performance improvements that you're looking for you've got to get comfortable with doing a little bit less every now and again to allow that boy to recover yeah and i think that if you are someone that you know you mentioned there that sort of like attitude where you get you we are a bit addicted to it and it's difficult to have those times often if you don't have those natural sort of breaks in your in your in your training cycle where you just train less because like like you say work or family life or something some stuff comes up and it just it interrupts you if you are one of these people that um maybe you're a professional athlete or you're um you just have the luxury of where your training doesn't really get interrupted and you've actually prioritized it uh, higher than other things and that's that's a different conversation of prioritizing training over everything else in your life but it's a case that we need to therefore plan to actually have those deload weeks and i think psychologically when you've planned to have it it allows you to um to deal with it that psychologically a little bit better it's like okay i've been trusting this process that tim's talking about i understand the the science behind the super compensation actually need to have this i've planned to have it in and that's that's a week where i'm going to do this 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 different or you know deloading doesn't have to be like doing nothing um but you're 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 reducing the amount of intensity of the things that you are doing and maybe do a few different things um have some variation but when you've planned it and just then start to trust the process it allows you to um, well when you've planned it it's going to probably go ahead but then it, it allows you psychologically to just deal with it as a disruption to your normal like i love going after it but um yeah and when you feel then the benefits of having some of that super compensation taking place when you've been resting then you start to get the buy-in of like, okay, these deload weeks, as long as I'm working hard when I'm supposed to be working hard, these deload weeks really do help me push on. And, you know, to, to echo something you said at the beginning, if you're training really hard and you're not getting any better or any stronger, it's not that you're not training because you've just said, yeah, I'm consistently training really hard. It's that you're not recovering. 
Um, and so addressing that is a great first point, Timbo, and very, yeah, super, super, super important. When we're talking about longevity, talking about looking after ourselves and talking about, you know, as our philosophy of wanting to be able to do cool things and be able to move and enjoy my body when I'm very old, like it's important that I'm addressing some of those issues right now. And it's also this, considering the rest of the emotional stress and load yeah. you've got on during the week as well, if work's super busy or, or I've, I've got a baby who doesn't sleep through the night at the moment. So me going in and thinking I'm really going to go and bust out PBs at the moment is, is, is unrealistic. And then also, like it's a little bit dangerous. Like if I'm going in tired, I don't really want to be going pushing that red line yeah. because my system is going to be under a little bit of stress. And, and please, like I've been in this game long enough to know this to be true. Don't let what you see on social media indicate or determine or affect influence how hard you think you should be training because you see other people training hard and everyone's sending it on Instagram, right? Everyone's doing like absolutely like hard out sessions. There's, there's a time and a place for that, but their circumstances and situation is very likely to be different to yours. So listen to your body, do what's right for you, play the long game and focus on yourself, not on everybody else. Yeah. What, what about then if we switch gears into um, the opposite of, of rest, of training? <laughs> when we are, if someone's struggling with some, um, with some plateaus and it's like, actually, what can I do, lads? in my actual training to try and get through these things. Um, and um, <laughs> a friend of mine, he's actually been SNC coach, Matt Parr, he's been SNC at, at, at Leicester Tigers and he's just moved to um, to France for, I can't remember which uh, club there, but he used to say, um, you gotta keep the body guessing. He liked like funny, like interesting plays, but he's like, keep the body guessing, but variety or changing things up. And there's a whole load of different variables that we've got potentially, um, to play with the everything from the tempos that you're working out um isometrics there's there's those types of things would be nice to touch on i think and the other thing that's coming that i'd like to maybe just throw in the mix is figuring out like what's the strength issue what's the what's the thing that's holding you back causing this plateau is it that actually you like shoulders a bit unstable or your hip or whatever the thing is like trying to actually find and do and, and enjoy the process of problem solving okay i hit this plateau rather than being frustrated with it flip it on its head and go okay so i've hit a plateau why why have i hit a plateau and trying to understand that and then you can start to potentially use um the some of these changing up these variables to to to, to go after that point in your your training and your strength whatever it is to actually address it i'm just thinking of saying someone like i realize that actually i'm really weak in like this certain position i might use an isometric at the like midpoint in my pull-up for example to help me through that section or whatever it may be but there there might be an opportunity to use a different variable within my training rather than having to like carte blanche train change everything um and if I've thought about and tried to do a little bit of investigative work of what the issue is causing it is, I think then we can be a little bit more um, efficient with what we do. Yeah, I think yeah, it's, a, it's a good point. And I think just before I, I sort of respond to that bit, this this just be, we'll deal with the skill component side of yeah, things because yeah. one of the oftentimes people will talk about um, a plateau or struggling to make progress in something like a handstand training. I won't dive into too much about that because we can we can do another podcast. We've, I think we've probably covered it in the past, but there is going to be a period of where you're learning a complex skill where you just got to keep going. <laughs> like it will feel like a plateau, but in your early days of handstand training, um, this kind of cognitive phase, you can make quite fast progress, and then you hit this kind of associative phase, and it's like it just takes a long time, and you just got to keep going. Yeah. So if you're following a structured training program and you've got the right sort of methods and progressions and drills, you will get there. But you've just got to you got to dig in and go through this period where it feels like not a lot's happening. I'm watching my daughter learn, learn to walk at the moment, and she's just she's in that phase right yeah. now. She kind of could do it if she, it's, but she sits like she bottles it and blah, 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 <laughs> on the side. Um, but yeah, you just keep going. If it's a skill side of things, and you've got the right drills and progressions. Just keep going. Loads of times, people come to workshops and they're like, "What am I not doing?" I'm like, you, "There's nothing you're not doing. You just need to do more yeah. of it because your brain has got to learn this this um, this new movement pattern." Now, the other side of that is going is often then, as to your point, Jacko, of going, what are you not doing? So maybe you've exhausted the level of, um, of, of neuromuscular control. Let's say, if you neurally 
can have, have eked out everything you can do from muscle. We had this conversation with Ross mm. Edgley a while yeah. back. Then one way to go, and, and that's kind of like you're getting your muscle up, but you want to go and do, you've got one muscle up, but you can't get any more out of it. Then, and you've really kind of exhausted that from a neural perspective. So you've done quite a lot of maximal strength training, power training, which you'll end up doing like with, with our programs to get that first muscle up. To go and do more muscle ups, it might be that you need a big, bigger muscles so that you've got more fibers to their core contribute towards creating more force. Um, there's a reason why strong people are quite big most of the time. Yeah. Um, so because bigger muscles can produce more force, quite simply. So it might be that you switch tact and go, I'm going to go and do 6, 10, 12 weeks, 3, 6 months of hypertrophy training, like strength mass development because I'm going to create bigger muscles which can produce more force and then I will come back and I'll make that that muscle faster and more explosive so I can go and do five consecutive muscle ups on the bounce or whatever it might be. The other one would be like pull ups and people will often kind of go, I see people going and hitting four or five pull ups and they're like, I can't get any more. Now we could apply that same strategy, but equally it could also be that you are losing stability around the shoulder and therefore your body can't actually stabilize a joint and it won't, the brain won't let you produce ex or high levels of force around an unstable joint. It will just shut it down because it's trying to protect the system. So in that situation, often what we'll find is people have kind of got some pull-ups, but what they really need is a block of scapular shoulder stability type work, which is going to create stronger foundations. Yep. So essentially, they can hang from the bar for longer in a stable position, and then you'll be able to get to do more pull-ups. So identifying what your weak link is, and there's a really easy takeaway from this. The thing that you don't like doing <laughs> is probably the thing that you need to do more yeah. of. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a lesson for life, Timbo. That's just not training. <laughs> yeah, it's easy though, isn't it? Like go in and go, I'm really good at handstand push-ups. I'm going to go and do that. Like, But what am I, like if I want to do a given movement, like I probably need to go and do something that I'm not very good yeah. at and I don't like doing. Yeah. Be, but that's often where your the biggest plateau buster is recovery. And then do the stuff you're not very yeah. good at. That will probably get you where you need to yeah. be. Yeah, yeah, no, love that, I love that. And I think that that's if you can if you can simplify if you can try and give a, a simple message for a uh, uh, a potentially complex but certainly frustrating topic or area, having some more rest and like you say, doing the things that you know you should do but you, you put off or you just shy away from. It's difficult though. Like and again, the psychology comes into that. It's hard. It's, it's hard to do something you don't feel good at. Your ego has to take a bit of a hit. Um, it's just physically actually harder to do something you're not good at. Um, and sometimes it's it's just something that you're not good at in terms of say we took that example like stability compared to like all out strength. Maybe maybe you're quite good. Your system's well conditioned to like do five by five on something heavy. But when you're asked to do like twenty reps of something, you just hate it mentally and physically hate it but actually it's those those stabilizers need a bit more time to work on so if and that's probably because what type of thing i was wondering if i was listening to this and we're saying like try to understand where your weak link is or what's what is your issue with my question would potentially be like well how do i how do i know and i think that you'd hit the nail on the head in the simple like you can obviously do it for some investigative work if you're working with a coach like in more detail but you hit the nail on the head and going like what are you really crap at and hate doing? Like, that's probably the weak link. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, and that's where, like, uh, to, to shout about our programs too much, but, like... Yeah, it's our podcast. You can shout about our programs. That's fine. Actually, <laughs> we've actually phased them in a, in, a, in a structured approach. So the reps and sets will change throughout, yeah. the, throughout the week. So you'll do some of that work where it's like, this is just like engine work. We're just going to get bigger muscles, and then we're going to go and make you more explosive and powerful. So it's periodized for you. Um, but it is sometimes difficult if you don't know training to, to kind of work out what you sh what you shouldn't mm -hmm. be doing because you might even not even know about scapular stability for uh, or, or stabilizing the shoulder for a, for a pull up um, and how that might contribute. So I think like it becoming you, you mentioned it before of like um, becoming a bit more of a student of the sport and understanding yeah. where why why you're struggling what's going wrong for you, understanding your body, getting some support from some some people that have uh, that you trust and can and can help you along that journey. Um, and it is just, it's that, it's that process sometimes of just switch the stimulus. And, and often you'll find that, I was just going to say one hard thing around this is that if we say, right, you're in a plateau, you're probably not feeling great about your training. And then what Tim just said, I just talked about myself in the third person and that's, that's oh, like that. isn't it? <clears throat> what I just <laughs> said was then go and do stuff you don't like doing. Yeah. Well, in a plateau, it's much easier to go and do the stuff that you do yeah, want to yeah. do. So this was kind of like my zoom out bigger picture kind of conversation of going, if you're in a plateau and it's beating you down, remember training is supposed to be fun. Yeah. So 
if we are if we're not professional athletes at least and, and not doing it for a living so i think it's going to switch the stimulus so you might just go and do a block of training that makes you feel good or you might so say if it's a pull-up example just go and do some back hypertrophy training most people enjoy that sort of stuff because it's a little bit like easier it's not so complex just reps and sets yeah. grind it out and you generally feel pretty good off the back of doing it so switch the stimulus find out about different types of training and, and try and go and down one of those routes and, and keep the movement pattern specific so if you're doing pull-up work or muscle-up based work it makes sense to go and do something around pulling yeah. strength speed stability don't go and start doing pushing stuff because it's not going to have a massive help um and then the other thing i was going to say is like just change the stimulus give yourself a break like oftentimes I'll have done stuff like plans training for me. We got into this kind of t this realm and I, I was kind of getting frustrated with it, hit a plateau, wasn't getting anywhere. So I just binned it off for a while. I went and did something different and wasn't in my mind anymore mm. training plans. But when I came back to it, I had not really lost anything. If anything, in some ways, if I'd done some strength based work of just like general pushing based work, I came back and felt pretty yeah. good. Um, and then, then I've got a rejuvenation of, of life around it. I went, you know, I'm going to go and do a little bit more into this. I'm, I'm kind of in that phase now. I've not touched it for ages, but yesterday I was like, I got back into a little bit of planche kind of push up stuff. I'm like, yeah, do you know what? I'm ready to go and, and play around with this again. And then just my last point on this one, and then I let Jacko yeah. wrap it up. Sometimes go and change it entirely. So we'll get a lot of people who come from one more form of exercise into calisthenics. We'll get people who come to calisthenics and they go, I'm going to go to somewhere else. Like I've started CrossFit for a bit and Jack is doing some running and, and it, calisthenics is still a very much part of how I train the upper body, but I've just brought a different stimulus in there because sometimes a plateau can just be around training in general. Yeah. Uh, it might not be specific to calisthenics. And sometimes in those scenarios, it's okay to go and do something else. There's a lot of thought in my head and Jack and I've talked about this offline podcast around identity and stuff of like, I don't have to be, I just, because I do calisthenics and have a business called the school of calisthenics, doesn't mean I can't enjoy other things. It's just that I have, it still remains part of my training. So you, you are free to go and do whatever you mm. want and try other things. And that's good for your physical literacy. It's good because CrossFit for me has made me address some, some def deficits in my metabolic and, or fitness side of things. Um, and then I'm still going to go and do that for a while. It doesn't mean I'm gone forever, but I might come back and go, do you know what? now I'm ready to go and do this other mm. thing. And you can come back to it with a little bit of, of freshness yeah. around it. And that is, that is huge. Yeah. I think if people have never done that before, gone, right, going to do something completely different. If you've, if you've never done that um, or just left something alone for a while, I'm, I'm not going to touch on that. And I'm just going to, I might just do a different element of my training or you might do something completely different. When you come back to, so long as that you're doing some work and it's like in some way related, then you'll be quite surprised at how much better that thing that you were previously plateaued on. It's like, wow, this actually feels pretty good. Um, and then, it, like you say, it gives you back that like that love and that that sort of desire to to go chase after it. Because if you're if you're getting super frustrated and you're not making progress and you're in a plateau, like it's it's demoral. It can be demoralizing mentally. Um, so yeah, there's there's if that's something you've not tried and there'll be something because if you're into your training there'll be something that you've never done before and you're like oh i ain't got time to go and do karate as well i don't know whatever it is do you know what i mean like say something yeah. and it's like well just do that for a few weeks and just like enjoy doing something completely different and then come back then come back and just see how that that yeah that that improvement in just your overall physical literacy and what you'll when you start to move in different ways you're training differently you'll learn again more stuff about your body you know you say they're like doing some more metabolic work you find out like where you're actually at on that and you go okay um maybe it's good maybe it's not maybe it's something i want to want to work on and but until we go and dab our toe in these different areas um we're not actually gonna know and you know bring it right back round to where we started like it can be a great way to get yourself through um through a plateau because some of it could be just the whole thing's just got a bit stagnant yeah <clears throat> i've got one more. Okay, on then. <clears throat> sorry i had to cough then um if you listen to this and go i've listened to you boys and you've not addressed my problem yet i'm doing all those things <laughs> if you're going in the session into sessions every week and you're doing the same number of reps and sets every week every session then there's no reason why that's the, that's why you're not progressing yeah. so if you don't know what you did the week before that's also a good reason so if you've got to continue to try to do some more load so that we have to scale with this progressive overload either through volume intensity 
whatever the variable adjustment yeah. might be, we need to be doing more effectively of whatever it is each week to try and get that progressive overload. So what that means is it might be rather than doing three sets of 10 every week and doing that for four weeks, I'm manipulating those rest periods. So say I'm doing a weight or I'm doing pull-ups and I can do a certain amount, I might just keep a note of that one. And that's where this within calisthenics is important for a training diary because in the gym environment you might go on did 22 kilo dumbbells last week i'll try 24 kilos this week or whatever it might be if you can do five pull-ups like how and you can't do six yeah. or seven or you're aiming for eight it can be quite difficult to kind of work out how you're going to make that a bit easier so a real easy way to get overload in that environment is just or that context is keep a training diary and if you do four reps one week that's cool the next week try and do five it's dead simple. And and you'll find that there's that adding stuff on or add or you go three sets one week, I'm gonna try and do four sets the next week or five sets the next yeah. week. And and this is where periodization can be really simple. Just try and do a little bit more yeah. each week and then do that deload. Because if you're doing that, you're going to need that recovery phase. So yeah. those two things can go together. Yeah. And it might be this it might be that like broken sets like we talked about before. So doing if that use that example like four pull ups and then like five, like it's quite difficult to like fat's like a 25 percent increase it's a big jump so actually maybe you do three pull-ups have a little rest and you do two and that makes up your five or you do four plus one with like and the little rest is only like 10 20 seconds or something so there's there's little ways that you're just able to add that little bit in it doesn't have to be all exactly the same like if you uh what's that phrase if you, you always you'll always get what you what's the hold on i'm gonna butcher it you're if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. So if you always go in and do three sets of 10, you're just going to get good at doing three sets of 10. You're not going to get any better at doing anything else. So um, you do have to provide something different. And it can be as simple as have a little break, do another rep. Oh, I didn't do that last week. Well, that's that's a progressive overload from the week before. Yeah. Sweet. So if you are, yeah, if you want some training programs which are periodized for you, you can take some of the guesswork out of this sort of stuff. Then we have those in our online programs um all sorts of things hand stands more subs human clothes lots of different stuff in there for you to go and play around with all of it is laid out in this way so you are getting that uh, that periodized overload and the deloads scheduled for you you'll learn a lot about training as well we are an educational organization as well as a training platform and provider so if you want to go and get a little bit of knowledge around your training then there's all of that is in our online platform as well. And you will leave not only having to achieve the skills that you want because we put self-assessments in, we help you to check base, we give you little directions, cues, all this sort of stuff. It's designed to help you avoid plateaus at each um, journey step along the way. But you'll also come out of it knowing a lot more about your training so you can then become a master of your own training. Yeah. That has got to be worth worth the time and investment to read a little bit and learn a little bit along the way. Yeah, investing some, t you never regret investing some time in, in understanding yourself, your body and your training, if that's what you're into. So yeah. And, uh, and a reminder, what we said at the beginning of the podcast, if you want to come and you're fed up of doing it online, you want to come in person, we've got workshops in Staffordshire on the night of the weekend on the 19th of February. That's coming up very quickly. And then, um, the 6th of March in London details are on the website. Look at the click on the workshops link and, um, yeah, there will be some more being announced very soon too. We hope to see you there. Amazing. Until next week, keep exploring your physical potential through movement, strength, and play. Class dismissed. Mm -hmm.